thanks for the introduction. Um, and I'm excited to discuss today um, what I would characterize as the smallest scale of our urban uh, water innovation um, analysis as I'm working directly at the building scale. So as we've come through um, Eli Bouzaid and uh, Mate Georgescu's talks the last two weeks, um, looking at the city and the climate and the scale of the broader urban environment um, down to the building. Today I want to go through how systems directly at the building scale um, and the exchanges that happen between the surfaces and the streams, both in terms of energy and water, particularly in the domain of the quote-unquote energy water nexus, and today I'm calling that the energy water urban nexus. Um, although most energy water nexus elements are somehow directly related to the urban environment. So as far as my background goes in this domain, um, I am originally from Iowa, so I use silos in everything. And uh, here in this case, I'm discussing the silos between those two appointments um, that you heard mentioned my faculty appointment in engineering and my appointment in architecture, which from a disciplinary standpoint are often quite far from each other, and as I started off as an engineer in mechanical engineering, environmental engineering, looking at buildings um, as systems that I wanted to be more uh, environmentally friendly and more energy efficient, um, looking at the way architecture designed many buildings in an intuitive sense felt like it wasn't very effective. Um, but eventually um, I did a lot of research on the ways in which design processes are utilized and, and the way that engineering and architecture can be brought together. Um, but the result of that has been this joint appointment and then my research, of course, bringing two very disparate domains together has resulted in a lot of chaos. And the chaos I'm referring to is that of the thermodynamics and the heat transfer and the mass transfers that we'll be discussing today because there's a huge amount of complexity um, between the domains of engineering and architecture that span well outside the sort of analytical and systematic analysis um, that we mostly focus on in the technical domains that we've discussed thus far and bridge into the domains of the generative and the creative aspects of architectural design. So within the Chaos Lab, which is, I am the self-named director of Chaos, um, and what we look at are how all the different cooling and heating elements in buildings, including the thermodynamics of water systems and evaporative uh, exchanges, can be integrated for architectural, optimi architectural optimization. Um, and, and in that realm, of course, involves a lot of experimentation and, of course, the real source of all my chaos. And if you want to see who exactly I am besides a digital voice on your computer, you can see me in the lower right here in the chaos of my bicycle, which, like all things that we do with buildings, we take a traditional system and try and use it for a novel and paradigm shifting way. In this case, using a bike to carry my four daughters instead of just one person. So with all that chaos being uh, summarized now, let's move on to some of the more technical details um, that we'll be discussing today. First, uh, I'll be talking about the building systems level, and in this case I'm referring to the energy part of the energy water nexus, so how energy drives a bunch of different interactions with water systems. Um, we'll start with a little history of energy and the water relationships in buildings and then go through how that relates to the urban analysis of, of climate systems. Um, uh, and that will relate more directly to the previous talks in the context of um, how building surfaces and systems interact with the urban climate. Um, and then we'll go through some techniques we used with thermal imaging um, and then talking about some how cooling towers and how comfort systems are related to the building system level and the energy level. And then we'll shift into sort of the water systems, which will kind of be a beginning to bridge into the thrust B element of UN, which has more to do with the water infrastructure itself. Um, but energy is definitely related there, and this still relates to the climate itself. So systems like cooling towers, um, which are building systems themselves, relate directly to the climate. And water systems and infrastructure um, and water recovery from wastewater are 
projects that we've touched on um, within the research that I've been doing uh, that are all relevant to the building infrastructure. And so we'll we'll touch on that briefly at the end, um, as well as sort of wrapping up with some of the more larger scale interventions and innovations that we view from a design side of things in the third part on urban water, energy recovery and utilization, and the indirect evaporative cooling opportunities where we can also utilize unique forms of radiant exchange uh, to manipulate the urban thermal environment and urban water usage. So to start, we'll be discussing building systems and the energy water urban climate. And just to begin, I'd like to start with the longest historical uh, overview I can find relating to the built environment. And since uh, one of the big benefits of being in the UN project is the exchange of data, I thought it would be fun to start with my largest data set, um, which I don't need to share uh, directly because it's all on Google. Um, and this has to do with uh, why we face so many challenges uh, in the built environment in buildings and in the urban context itself. So why exactly do we have this urban um, word in our research? And one of the ways that one of the, the biggest things about urbanism um, has been the fact that the rapid rise of, of populations moving to uh, the rise of urban populations. And if you look at the words used in publications, which since Google is this huge source of publication data, it's very fascinating to me to look at these two words, elegance and complexity, and to help us understand the systems that we're dealing, that we have to deal with um, and to recognize the importance of engineering solutions and developing a better understanding of the physical and built environment because we're dealing with a larger set of physical components, scientific complexity, as well as design opportunities um, with the growing population and the growing amount of infrastructure we deal with. Um, arguably, though, some respect for ele elegance would be helpful in perhaps some of the design aspects. But in terms of the urban environment and the building built environment, complexity is something that has sort of remained a fixed aspect in buildings. Um, one that began about a hundred years ago with one big step change in the complexity of buildings, which I hope everyone realizes we've only been able to air condition buildings for about a century. And Willis Carrier, who of course invented air conditioning before it was cool, developed, I wish I could hear people laugh, this is the problem of the webinar. Um, some of my <laughs> favorite. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. So the, the, um, the history of air conditioning is one that is uh, directly intertwined with all of the uh, energy water aspects related to humidity that we have to deal with because the biggest uh, achievement of the air conditioner that was developed by Carrie was that it could remove uh, the humidity from the air um, as well as making the air cooler. Um, and it wasn't until the 50s when actually air conditioners um, became pretty ubiquitous. Um, so it took about 50 years to be able to move from the ice blocks in the upper left to uh, the window air conditioner in the lower right and to truly be able to uh, manage temperature and humidity in spaces um, at the flick of a switch. And with that came many standards about what humidity levels and energy usages, energy inputs and um, uh, humidity removal rates need to be deployed to achieve comfort. Um, and more recently, these have evolved into efficiency standards, both in terms of water usage and things like cooling towers, as well as, of course, um, and energy efficiency standards for new high performance buildings. Um, but from a architectural point of view, the way in which we design and install many of these large systems that manipulate our air temperatures and humidities has remained the same um, since the first large installations were inherent, which were inherently a part of the modernist architectural uh, movement which in the 1950s here you see the 
the UN building, the Lever House, and the Seagram building, which are three pinnacles of modernism from the 1950s built in New York. And in order for these buildings to function with their glass walls, they need to have large cooling systems installed with enormous refrigeration units that are conditioning huge amounts of air. So think about the amount of air in that entire space, that entire geometry in the image being pushed through the building one time per hour by huge fans located in the top bars here you can see in the two right buildings, and then pulling all the humidity out of the air in the summer and delivering cold enough air to mitigate all of the solar gains that are happening in those buildings. And today we still use very similar systems. So there's a specific uh, uh, similarity between these systems that you might see just looking out your window of the small split residential units if you're at home or maybe the window unit hanging out of a, out of a window. Um, and these units use the same sort of mechanical uh, systems, the same thermodynamic processes to reject the heat from buildings. Um, but they aren't necessarily a part uh, of the style, although many of the mechanisms are still in, in, implicit in the way we design buildings. So the takeaway argument from this sort of initial uh, histor historical uh, perspective is to remember that a lot of the engineering systems and um, the technical uh, changes or technical innovations we would like to implement are often built into significant um, cultural and, uh, and aesthetic movements um, and that those ne aren't necessarily always limiting, but in some cases understanding them can help us understand how to make changes within those, those systems. For example, uh, thinking, rethinking the way the spatial layout of buildings in New York uh, might work. Because currently the sort of ubiquitous deployment of heating and cooling systems um, is one where we don't really consider um, the role of all this equipment in, in its urban context at the scale beyond the building. So the fact that the towers have huge portions of their space and huge amounts of air being pushed in and out of the urban climate causing massive changes to the lo very local temperatures and humidities as the heat is rejected from those buildings. And similarly, in this case, with split units and window air conditioners, as those agglomerate in space in the built environment, we have significant uh, aggregation of higher temperatures from the emissions of these units that are all trying to keep the spaces on the other side of those walls cold, while at the same time playing a significant part in the temperatures and humidities that evolve around the spaces of the city. And one of the analyses that we've done as part of the project has been specifically around trying to understand the role and the relationship between systems such as these um, in the context of the broader urban, urban climate and how there are implicit feedback loops between the performance of these systems and the primary energy demand and the water demand to operate these systems based on the fundamental physics of how temperature in the city affects the performance of those units. So the building itself is a very simple construct, right? The buildings are our ultimate control volume in an engineering context, right? Energy in equals energy out. The first law of thermodynamics makes it very easy to figure out if there's a bunch of sun going through the window and the temperature outside is very warm, then there's going to be a desire for the building to be warmer because the sun is inputting heat and the air outside is making the building want to be warm. So in order to make the building cooler, we need to be removing heat and vice versa as in the image below. If you want to keep the building warm and you have a certain amount of heat loss, then you need to add energy to the building. And so from a design context, this is the way that the building shell and the building systems are sized and designed and implemented. So the size of the cooling machine 
the size of the heating machine and the boiler in the case of combustion uh, is determined by making this very simple ba balance, right? And for heating, obviously, combustion is a very direct and simple way to provide heat. But in the case of cooling, we have to understand what exactly is the mechanism that Willis Carrier invented and how do we remove the excess heat and the excess water from the airstreams and buildings, right? And so in terms of uh, uh, balances, it's also important to recognize here that we also can understand something about the water balance in terms of the mass of water in air and understanding how air moves in and out of buildings. So the scientific, uh, the applied science of heating and cooling that must be understood to really address buildings holistically um, is one of understanding these refrigeration cycles necessary for chillers and air conditioning machines, which if run in reverse are also uh, heat pumps, right? So any of these machines that are removing heat from buildings or moving heat into buildings in the case of a heat pump. And those are directly related to the second law of thermodynamics, which we'll touch on in a moment. And then secondly, one of our favorite topics in the chaos lab is psychrometrics, um, uh, which allows us to manage the humidity in the air and is one of the cornerstones of Willis Carrier's work. And then finally, you have to understand how exactly the heat exchange between bodies and space operates. And that happens both at the building scale between people and systems, as well as in the urban context. And that's uh, built upon several mechanisms of heat exchange from convection to evaporation and radiation, etc. that must be contemplated. And we'll step through each of these three aspects to help you become more well-versed in the applied science of heating and cooling in buildings. So the most critical piece of the performance in building systems is understanding for a chiller uh, or a heat pump in this, which is displayed in this case, is that the unit is not creating heat as in the case of combustion, but rather moving heat using a thermodynamic refrigeration cycle. And it does that by playing with the phase change of a refrigerant and the refrigerant is pumped up to a high pressure where it gives off heat in, into a higher temperature space um, as it condenses and then it goes through an expansion valve where it expands to a lower pressure and, there, and thereby can evaporate and absorb heat from the outside in the case of a heat pump. Um, in order to improve the performance of these systems, the second law of thermodynamics that I mentioned basically tells us that the temperature across which these devices push heat affects how easily it can push that heat. So it's like push, um, setting a box up on a table. Uh, if the box is very heavy, it's hard, um, but also if the table is very high, it's harder. So there are two aspects that make it harder to move heat in and out of a building. And this is the reason that ground source heat pumps are more efficient than air source heat pumps. Um, and these and, and a chiller, right, um, is exactly the same situation where the ground is cooler in the summer than the air um, and the ground is warmer than the air in the winter. And so having this temperature source that's closer to the room air in the building allows us to have a higher performance. And this coefficient of performance um, gives us the ratio of the amount of heat moved to the electricity that goes in to the system. And so we can push heat in uh, out of buildings using this refrigeration cycle. And we can do that with a typical machine is often uh, on the order of three to four units for one of those split unit machines sitting on the ground can move three or four units of heat out of the building with every unit of electricity putting in. So it's in fact a multiplier. Um, and here is what that performance looks like depending on what that temperature lift, the difference from inside to outside, in, outside is. And what we're interested in doing is finding ways to drive down that temperature. And what we were investigating in our research initially when sort of we were contextualizing the role of buildings and systems in the urban climate with respect um, to the A2 um, um, uh, theme or thrust uh, was to 
understand that all of these systems that are found everywhere throughout the, the city have a direct relationship to the temperature, which of course varies, as we've heard, um, due to climate change, due to the urban microclimate, due to infrastructure itself, which is the piece we're interested in, how the, the emission of the heat from these systems themselves build, change the performance, which affects uh, uh, the amount of electricity that it takes to drive these systems, as well as the amount of heat that they're rejecting into the environment. So the takeaway really is that temperature really matters. So if you're looking at the x-axis on this plot, as you go to the right, you're reducing the lift that you have to in the amount by which the temperature lift, the amount by which you have to decrease the temperature um, of your refrigerant working fluid in the air conditioning unit in order to take the heat from outside, from inside and push it outside. So if we take an example of one of those mini split units that's sitting, that was in the image previously, it may be uh, rejecting its heat to the air outside, which could be up to, it has to be designed to be able to do that up to say 100 or 110 degrees in our uh, uh, Phoenix case study city. Um, and in that case, in order to push heat out into 110 degrees, it has to be even warmer than that in order for the heat to move out into that temperature. So 110 degrees is something around 40, 45 uh, degrees. And so it has to be even warmer than that. So often the heat exchangers on the condensers, the part that's rejecting heat outside from, from window unit air conditioners and those split unit air conditioners is often 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and then inside, in order to make the air cold and to dehumidify the air, right, in order to condense the water out of the air, that, that evaporator coil, the little heat exchanger um, across which the air inside your house is blown to cool it down and dehumidify it, that's often below 10 degrees C. And so the temperature lift um, can often be as high as 40 degrees on the far left of this plot in order to achieve the cooling. And so even it can often be even more, even off the plot to the left where the, the COP is down below three. Um, but as you move to the right, um, we can think about ways that um, different systems can help us to reduce those temperatures and also ways in which we can try and mitigate some of those temperature effects in the city and understand how those mitigations can then feed back and help the performance of systems like this because the refrigeration cycle is directly related to those temperature lifts um, that are affected by the urban climate. And so the tool that I use in, in my research um, is this concept of exergy. Um, which is from the second law of thermodynamics, which is just a tool that allows us to calculate um, the inherent value of different temperature thermal sources. So if we go back, the basic premise is these equations for COP offer us a ratio of the potential movement of energy um, with different temperature sources. And so if I do an energy analysis of a building on the left, and this is in the case for a combustion source, just to show you an extreme version, um, the combustion energy efficiency may be very high. So the only thing being lost is a little bit of direct heat loss out of the chimney of the boiler in the building on the left. But if we analyze that same building in terms of the exergy content of the heat, as soon as the heat from the flame is delivered to the room, which is now at 20 degrees, it's the same amount of heat. So the heat at 1,000 degrees is dissipated into the room to keep the room at 20 degrees because the outside air in this case, um, I think, was for a condition of zero degrees um, Celsius. So what happens then is the quality of the energy in air at 20 degrees is much lower than the quality of the energy in a flame at 1,000 degrees. And so it's a mismatch in the temperature and the quality and the resulting potential that is described by the second law of thermodynamics. And so this was just a way that we used in our research to try and demonstrate that when designing building systems, we shouldn't just be focusing on energy efficiency because then we tend to only eliminate the direct loss of energy and we miss the opportunity to systematically improve the networked performance of different pieces in the building system energy chain. Um, 
Oops. So in order to think about the cooling version of, of this problem, we have to remember that in the case of the room air, now at 20 degrees C, remember the exergy that would be coming into a building in the cooling case will be have a higher quality because it's cooled down to, say, 8 or 10 degrees Celsius or 40 or 40, 45 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit in order to remove the moisture from the air, right? And the way that that works brings us to the second and most important aspect of cooling in building systems is the psychrometric chart. Um, and this chart here um, is, in fact, the very first psychrometric chart ever drawn, which was drawn by our friend, again, Willis Carrier, um, who recognized the technical ability of a cooled down thin heat exchanger to cause water to condense out of the air at very specific temperatures and that there was a relationship between the amount of water removed from the air, the relative humidity, and the temperature of that air. And so the way air works in terms of uh, a little more clear psychrometric chart here is when air is warmer, it's the same thing as having a really big sponge in the upper right. And when the air cools down, it's the same as squeezing that sponge down and it basically can't hold as much water. And so the reason the psychrometric chart has this curved line on the left, that's 100% humidity. And that's the reason why when you walk out of Starbucks with your iced coffee, you get that water condensation on the outside. And that condensation is as the air around your cup drops below the temperature. So if we go to the middle of this chart here where it says 25 degrees, um, at 25 degrees, uh, you have about 20 grams of water in every kilogram of air, or about cubic meter of air, roughly. Um, and as soon as you get below 25 degrees at that level of humidity, you're going to have water start to condense out of the air as it cools down. And that's the exact same phenomenon that, that Willis Carrier took advantage of in his cooling system. So the coils are below the dew point of the air, and so when you drop the air below that dew point, you remove the water. But we don't want to supply, so in the case of the, the cooling system, we usually cool the air down to at least 10 degrees on the left here, and then when we reheat it, the water's been removed, we, we move straight along to the right. Maybe I can show my pointer here. So if I move this way to the right, well, First, we would come down from above as we condense the water out of the air this way, and then this is the coil, and then we move back as the air warms up in the building, right? And you can see these lines here are the lines of humidity in the building, and these humidity lines are the relative humidity that you perceive. And what we want to do is we want to be in a space that's usually somewhere between 70% uh, and 30% humidity, roughly. So we need to get in this sort of box around here. Maybe that's a little bit warm, a little too far to the right here. We want to be with like 20 degrees Celsius, so like 70 degrees and 25, somewhere down here in this range. And in order to land in this range, first we need to dehumidify the air, and that takes a lot of energy. So the dehumidification of air, these black lines, the last part of the chart, these lines are the amount of energy that we need to put in that we remove as we cool the air and dehumidify it. So a big fraction of the energy in the air is, in fact, from the removal of water. Um, and the other thing we can do with uh, air, back to the presentation. So the other thing we can do is think about how we might uh, use evaporation to cool the air, and there we go. Um, so as you evaporate water into the air, that changes the conditions. Um, so um, if you would uh, take a very cool mountain condition with uh, hardly any moisture in the air, uh, yeah, you can understand that, that as you move up the chart, you're adding an amount of, of water to the air, but the, the relative ability to have humidity in the air goes up um, as you have much higher temperature uh, climates. 
And if we want to think, oops, if we want to think about um, the ability to manipulate the uh, temperature in these systems, let me just go through this uh, in terms of the climate again here. So um, the important thing to understand is let's do a case study for Singapore. So in this chart here, uh, we can see that for Singapore in the upper right here, we have conditions year round in the range of 30 to 35 degrees and 80% humidity. And so uh, in that, and in the case in the Swiss Alps, in the top of the mountains, you may have hardly any air, uh, hardly any humidity in the air um, in cold temperatures. And um, if we would want to manipulate the temperature in Singapore, we need to go from a spot way up here on the chart and arrive back down here in our comfort range of say 20 degrees and 50% humidity down here. And so we would need to cool the air and then de and dehumidify the air down all the way to our 10 degree coil in order to let it heat back up and arrive somewhere in our position for comfort. Um, and in the humidification case then in, in Switzerland, we're down here, we have to um, just add moisture to the air and heat. And this is uh, a much more straightforward process because we can just evaporate water into the air and heat our air up uh, much more directly uh, to arrive at our com comfort condition. We don't need to deal with this um, added move of, of getting over to the condensation line on the psychrometric chart when we're dealing with heating. So cooling presents this unique challenge of dealing with the latent component or the moisture component of air cooling. And the other um, useful technique in terms of building systems that's very important for our conversation about the energy water nexus is understanding that if the outside air is at a temperature of 35 or say 30 degrees and 70% and humidity, kind of a, typ a typical challenging case. Um, what I can do is if I just spray water into the air freely, if I blow water droplets into the air, the air will adiabatically absorb that water and adiabatic means I'm not going up and down on the energy. So these are the energy, the black lines here are the energy bars here. So I'm going parallel to those energy lines and I'll go out and I can reach the saturation temperature. So I saturate the air with water. And by doing that, what have I done? I've moved the temperature down by four degrees without using any mechanical cooling. I didn't use any refrigeration device. And this is evaporative cooling. So if I'm in Colorado, as some of our, many of our friends are in UN, if I'm in Colorado, sometimes you may have 35 degree temperatures and even as low as 10% humidity, but a 10% humidity, I can use an evaporative cooler and go straight back down this constant enthalpy line and in fact arrive exactly at our comfort condition. So this is why in warm, dry climates, often evaporative cooling is a very effective way to achieve comfortable air temperatures. Um, but one of the problems is when you have a 10% humidity climate, that's usually also a sign of a more desert type of climate where the one thing that's usually missing is a excess of water. And so that water challenge there becomes very prevalent in being able to supply the water to do this evaporation and, and make this cooling technique possible. And one of the things we're interested in is the ability to do indirect cooling. So if I'm in, in New Jersey in the summer, we're often at least at say 28 degrees and 60% humidity. And when we're over here, if we do evaporative cooling, all we're doing is getting a little too humid and it's getting even yuckier and more, more moist. Um, but if we take this and evaporate out to here, what we can do is use the temperature we just gained, which is down here at 22. And we can take the air itself and exchange those temperatures and move straight over this way and get to a better temperature. Or we can use this temperature we've just achieved to cool down surfaces, right, in the exterior environment and play with the way in which you experience the surfaces around you. So these are some of the many ways that we play around on this psychrometric chart. And it's uh, not necessarily the most exciting um, piece of science. It's a very applied
tool that's used usually to design those air conditioning systems. But the ability to use evaporation freely without any, any in input is a very uh, specific opportunity that we can leverage using the psychrometric chart. And understanding then our different climate zones um, that we operate in is uh, an important aspect of our um, research in terms of thinking about what does it mean to manipulate the latent load when you have good temperatures but it's very, very foggy. Um, uh, you can think about how, what are the ways really in this situation in the middle, the only demand for manipulating the climate in this scenario is the removal of moisture from the air. Uh, there is no other cooling demand. And oftentimes people overlook the fact that air conditioning um, in, many, in many climate scenarios is really only removing moisture from the air. That's the only thing it's doing. Um, and in the case of building operations, we often have cooling towers um, that are rejecting the heat from buildings that are using that phenomenon we just described of evaporative cooling where they're using that indirect the temperature you can achieve by spraying water in the air in order to improve the performance of those cooling machines and what we were interested in doing was understanding better how exactly those temperatures evolve in the city so for example here's some air conditioning units where you can see them um, emitting the heat that they uh, are generating from their condensers and we surveyed the temperatures of these various systems. Um, uh, you can see uh, getting above here 55 degrees on the right from these window air conditioning units. Um, and then we kind of looked at the rooftop conditions where you often find um, in the city these uh, evaporative cooling towers that will be placed on the roof um, and understanding exactly where the heat loads evolve and understanding that urban canyon effect where we have some trapping of heat um, in the city while roofs themselves, uh, uh, as has been discussed, having different temperatures or having cool roofs or green roofs, as Matt discussed last week, um, play a big role in changing the conditions at the rooftops and on the walls. And once we understand all those different phenomena, the analysis that we did um, wasn't, wasn't with the urban climate itself, but was, was specifically to that feedback loop on the urban energy use for cooling. And what we found was um, when you combine all of the influences from the urban heat island itself, the broader temperature increase of around roughly uh, two to eight degrees, depending on the, the time and the scenario, um, and then the temperature increases we observed at rooftops from having very hot roofs and having air conditioning units mounted on the roof, and then finally in the urban canyon itself, understanding how the window units themselves are also heating up, we found that um, when we take those combined, it can be up to 100,000 houses worth of annual energy is expended due to the added load caused by these increased temperatures. So if these temperatures weren't there, you would reduce the New York, this is just for New York City, you'd reduce the New York City uh, primary energy demand for cooling for uh, by equivalent to 100,000 households worth uh, of cooling energy. And that's due to the change in the COP, that plot that we saw, the coefficient of performance caused by the shifts in temperature. So all these machines have to obey the second law of thermodynamics. And if the urban heat island increases the temperature by two degrees, it's going to increase a huge amount of electricity because all of the air conditioning units will experience that temperature rise. Um, and then we took a subset from data we collected about New York City um, of the number of cooling devices uh, on the roof, the number of condenser units on the rooftops, and then we took the number of window air conditioners estimated in New York City, um, and it was clearly the window air conditioners um, and the effect of having the, the trapped air in the urban canyons where you have even higher temperatures, and so this relates to another paper we did looking at how high the temperatures get in the narrow canyons, as in the first image we saw um, with the two buildings with all the units hanging on the side of them. So for the window air conditioners, the potential temperature effect from having air trapped in these smaller um, urban crevices is much higher than the overall urban heat island effect uh, by itself. And so the augmentation of the, the challenge of where we place and how we design our, our heat rejection systems and the broader effect of the urban heat island, which, as we learned last week, um, could be 
increased uh, as climate change, well, will increase as well um, along with climate change, these effects will feed back on the performance, not just on the cooling energy. So this does not take into account the fact that warmer temperatures would also increase the cooling demand of the buildings. Um, it just takes into account what the system performance change is. Um, and the other thing that happens in this terms of the system change is the more electric, the lower the COP of the system, the more heat it has to reject. The larger fraction of the energy that goes in gets rejected as heat going out. So it also has this positive feedback uh, on the heat being emitted into the urban system. Um, that being said, the anthropogenic emissions from the systems are, are not the most significant source of the urban heat island. The urban heat island is still largely driven by the phenomenon described by Ellie and Matt in terms of the uh, radiant and meteor the, the, the larger scale inputs from the urban climate. Um, I mean, if you think about the sun being a thousand watts per meter squared, most of these window air conditioners are about a thousand watts and we don't have one every square meter of the city. Um, but you can imagine that there are a lot of them, and so it is a, it is a significant component. Um, but in this case, these larger numbers are generally due to the, uh, the, the trapped air and the small uh, microcosms in the city of alleys and back lanes and, and overhangs where these units trap a lot of really warm air. Um, and so you can see here the, the plot of the COP and the sort of range that we were looking at how much the temperature increases um, from the system when you start to trap that air. So you can see on the right hand side that the window air conditioners COP gets driven down substantially um, and, uh, and that the, the roof, the urban heat island has also a substantial increase, decrease of the, of the system COP. Um, and so what we were arguing for um, in, our, in the subsequent work, as we'll eventually discuss more, from the water side is as we think about whether it's used to do useful to do evaporative cooling, if you use uh, evaporative cooling you can mitigate a lot of these direct uh, impacts from the increase in sensible temperatures caused by the urban heat island. So while the temperature increase in a city usually uh, is not necessarily accompanied with humidity increases, so we can maintain um, this wet bulb temperature for evaporative cooling. Um, and so this is one of the ways to consider how design opportunities may shift our ability to adapt to shifting temperatures in the city and to help to uh, uh, address the problem of the system performance in buildings. So these types of systems, these cooling towers, right, as we discussed, here's the psychrometric chart again, um, they can achieve a much more consistently low temperature for heat rejection but as we all learned um, two summers ago in New York, there was a big Legionnaire disease outbreak because when you're spraying water around at moderately warm temperatures uh, all the time, you need to treat that water to make sure it doesn't have uh, human health risks from bacterial growth. Um, and then you have to understand exactly what we're, we're interested in, and Ellie and I have been discussing, is what happens um, when these, these cooling towers start to combine and generate um, significant amounts of humidity addition, um, like what you're seeing here from a power plant where there's obviously a, a large plume of humidity being emitted into the air, and this isn't, this isn't what you see out of the top of a cooling tower, but when the city um, starts to really densify and you have a lot of these uh, evaporative cooling tower systems, there again will be a, a localized effect on the, the humidity level in the city, and we're interested in understanding that. Um, and in order to understand more broadly the effects of, of all these systems on the city itself, one of the important uh, components of the, the city temperature at the small scale, right? So we were going around taking these images with this small infrared camera. And at the small scale, um, the, the building thermal imaging is really useful for understanding what happens to surface temperatures in space. Um, and surface temperatures are key components to the urban, the heat, the radiant heat trapping um, that drives a lot of the urban heat island. But they also play a super important role in thermal comfort. Um, so understanding how different views of cities can help us both look at those units that we discussed in, in the paper we did, uh, understanding how those the surf, local surface temperatures can help us infer what's going on around units in terms of their heat rejection. 
here's some examples of those sort of nano climates um, around uh, window air conditioners where the temperatures can get up above 50 degrees, um, causing the units to work much harder. Um, and these little micro air climates are also generating surfaces that are at a higher temperature. And so people like this that are, you know, being nice and comfortable on the left with their iced coffees in their hands um, are in fact being affected both by the air coming out of that vent, but also by the surfaces generated um, by the hot air blowing on these overhangs where the radiation from those warm, those warm surfaces will be re-emitted on you. Um, and it's crucial to understand how all of these surfaces that get heated up have a really important relationship to the moisture events that happen in the city um, and there's a huge amount of latent energy that gets stored in the wetness of a building after it rains. And so here we have one look and this is something that Ellie has modeled extensively in the context of looking at the urban climate and the surface storage of moisture um, and we're sort of experimentally verifying that with some of these images here trying to characterize the effect of surface temperature uh, on, on the local space and how that shifts dramatically um, after it rains. But in order to understand exactly what those surface temperatures are doing, we have to meet this guy, uh, your fan, <clears throat> uh, Professor Fanger from uh, Denmark, who defined exactly how we understand thermal comfort um, and thermal regulation and how we design buildings to be comfortable, to uh, adapt our thermal regulation to the conditions around us, um, our metabolic rate sort of normalized to these numbers that he developed and created standards so that we understand better what's happening with the human body. Um, and the truth is that from the street level, humans are really terrible temperature sensors and um, radiation from surfaces is really critical for your perception. So you have radiation coming from all the surfaces around you that are skewing your, your perception of temperature. And the little um, uh, illustrated psychometric chart in the upper right um, helps to define that. This is from the Olgie text in the 1960s, really before the ubiquity of large air conditioning units meant that air movement and radiation were still important variables because for systems today, the surface temperature and sort of convection have been removed from the way we design building heating and cooling. Um, but in terms of the urban climate uh, and for new high performance systems, uh, radiant temperatures are very important. And so this book from the 60s sort of covers this wider range of thermal comfort, um, which we're much more interested in. Um, and we are concerned with trying to combine these two components of thermal comfort illustrated here. On the left, the radiant emission from your body and how it interacts with surfaces around you. And on the right, the convection from your body. So understanding better how how air movement um, affects your sensation. So the temperature and the radiation around you each account for about half, if you're sitting in a normal office right now at around 70 degrees, half of what you're sensing in terms of temperature is radiation. Um, and so in order to consider that, that phenomenon in terms of radiation, I'm running out of time here, um, I, wanted, I wanted to, you know, uh, uh, leave the discussion uh, to, to discuss a bit of our water system work, but the, the main takeaway uh, from, from the thermal comfort we'll come back to very briefly at the end in terms of some of our proposed work that we want to do in the future, looking at uh, how radiation works in these environments here in terms of the, the, the effect of the urban climate and the fact that these people in this image on the left are being affected by the radiation uh, in the system. And, and of the urban environment and the urban canyon, that there's an exchange that's happening that makes you perceive uh, the temperature to not necessarily be what you would measure with an air temperature thermometer. Um, but I think I might just skip over the energy and water uh, briefly because I think it will be covered in the B section uh, quite well. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, uh, that another important component of the uh, energy water nexus is in fact the water movement that's moving throughout the city. So the use of water in buildings, um, not just the climatological interactions of, uh, of water and humidity for building systems that we're looking at, but also how um, building systems are also moving water around at various temperatures. Um, and so some of the work we're doing looks at, in this case, the difference in the temperature of water in different building systems. So more high performance buildings tend to have 
warmer wastewater. And we did analysis with two PERP students last year with um, Sybil Charville at, at CSU and, and uh, uh, Jennifer at, at Berkeley looked at uh, the various levels of potential. So this is coming back to the same theme as in the, the climate, understanding how the temperature potential of wastewater can be leveraged as a means to understand how much potential heat recovery could be used in the system. And then also just the raw amount of energy, in this case, uh, the energy that's required to treat the water that comes out of the, the water system. So every gallon of water um, has a certain amount of energy in the plot on the right sort of plots, both the volume of, of potential water reused when you do uh, uh, gray water systems um, and reuse systems, as well as the energy that gets saved. Um, so I wanted to jump jump over that uh, very quickly in order to arrive at some of the uh, system designs very briefly that we're looking at in terms of water systems. So in the city, we understand um, geothermal systems as important temperature sources uh, for moving water uh, up into that, that radiant, warm environment of the urban canyon. Um, and we're looking at analysis of, of using boreholes from existing wells in Pennsylvania that are very, very deep from the uh, NGDS to supply the cities like uh, um, um, Pittsburgh with uh, a large scale uh, geothermal network of low temperature uh, heating and cooling uh, rejection sources. So this is sort of a plot of what Pennsylvania looks like um, if you consider the thermal resources uh, of the ground that could be distributed. Um, and if we want to design systems that leverage those low temperatures, um, this is where then we get to sort of begin to consider um, the opportunities of what it means to have uh, water and energy be drivers for design systems. Um, we worked on a project at Princeton on coastal resilience where part of it was understanding how the water systems in the built environment can be used to uh, uh, both help create more resilience in the system while, uh, while also being driving new urban ideas for, for the built environment. Um, vegetated system design, so the, what was discussed last week in terms of the ability of green roofs to play a role in changing the climate interactions. Um, there's also an important role in terms of managing stormwater. Um, and what we're most interested in is um, when you start to do green surfaces in the urban environment, how then coming back to that radiant temperature um, and, and beyond just the water management of, of reducing stormwater, how those colder surfaces reduce the thermal stress on people uh, in the built environment. Um, and we're, we're collaborating with uh, Marilis Nepromechi at uh, Florida International University to think about ways to graphically represent that um, with architectural students and do some more geometric analysis because for radiant heat transfer in the urban canyon, from a human perspective, um, the size and scale and geometry of the surface of around you um, play a, a significant role. So I want to just wrap up now, um, so we're out of time, uh, with one final uh, uh, discussion on, on the system levels uh, analysis. Let's skip ahead here. Um, and that is sort of this, this future work we hope to do on the radiant component uh, of heat stress. So we have developed a, a sensor that I just skipped over very quickly um, that we really hope to collaborate with other members of UN uh, on trying to measure more directly and more extensively the evolution of surface temperatures in the urban environment and to also understand how greenery and the access to blue and green infrastructure sort of affects those temperatures. So in the long wave spectrum where plants are emitting radiation that's much lower and lower temperature than a building wall that's been directly in the sun or a concrete or asphalt street um, that can often rise to 200 degrees. Um, understanding how those surfaces are affecting people uh, in the environment and resolving what's called the mean radiant temperature in this case throughout space of an urban space, not just a building space, which is where we've worked thus far, I think will be um, really critical. And we're doing that now in our own building, kind of understanding how the urban canyon that we have in our own backyard operates. We hope to expand that out. Um, here's some initial experiments in Tokyo where we, we demonstrated that in the urban environment there. My, my student, uh, PhD student in the, that's working on the UN project um, is currently on an exchange in Tokyo, but she took our sensor with us and some, took some mean radiant temperature 
measurements in these photos here um, to demonstrate that even though the air temperature in this case was 26 degrees, uh, the radiant temperature was in fact 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, so what you would perceive in this situation would be a temperature of above 30 degrees, say about the average of these two temperatures. Um, and that would be a much more uh, thermally intense experience um, than what one perceived by looking at a thermometer that said 26 degrees Celsius. So we hope to bring a human framework uh, to the energy water urban nexus where we start to consider both the city um, but more how people are conditioned by the city, not just the space itself being a, a conditioned thing in, in, on its own. So with that, I'm sorry to rush through the end, but I used up all my time um, and I'm happy to take any questions. And here's my email um, and the Chaos Lab web website uh, where we have a lot of these, these projects and information listed um, on the things that I had to sort of rush through. But again, thanks for uh, tuning in and look forward to any, any questions and hearing from anyone that has any follow-ups. Awesome. Thank you, Forrest. I think you truly are the director of chaos. I can't imagine what your yes. life's going to be like in about 10 years when your daughters all <laughs> become teenagers. Um, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we do have a, a question. This is actually from one of our URP students who's going to be uh, starting next week. He is wondering, could a city designed with fountains, waterfalls, or sprayers in front of every building be effective in keeping an urban canyon cool? Are there systems of this kind that don't have a high risk of causing Legionnaires outbreaks? Uh, yeah, so they're, they're at Transolar and Atelier 10 are a couple of firms that do some fun climate uh, designs in the built environment. And they've done some waterfall cooling systems. So you can definitely do cooling with waterfalls, but they usually use them for sort of three season spaces. Um, and it's not for uh, sort of ASHRAE level comfort conditions. So one of the things we're interested in understanding better is sort of broadening the idea of comfort um, because if you start to think about air movement and evaporative cooling and radiant cooling, you can think about things besides temperature and humidity affecting your thermal comfort. Um, and so the, the evaporative cooling component, if we would do it very broadly in buildings, and one of the things I skipped over was something that Eli Buzaid and I ha have worked on previously, which is thinking of ways to do exactly sort of what you asked, which is evaporative cooling in the walls of buildings, so that the walls of the buildings themselves, instead of experiencing the outdoor temperature and the, the sensible outdoor temperature, the walls would experience the wet bulb temperature. Um, and we kind of, one of the big challenges is thinking about how you uh, design that to not have a major issue with fouling or bacterial or um, some sort of contamination from biological elements. Um, but it was an interesting project. There's, there's certainly some fantastic material science in the domain of membranes and ways that you might think about um, designing those kinds of systems and using the sort of wet bulb temperature indirectly. So I think there's a one of the big overlooked aspects of evaporative cooling is that most people tend to think of swamp cooling alone. So also the waterfall coolers are humidifying the air in the space. Um, and so if it's already humid, then it doesn't help very much to add humidity to the air. But if you're doing uh, humidifying the air and the water on a surface, and then you use that surface to sensibly cool, so you don't add moisture, you just make the air adjacent to that surface cold, or you radiate energy by radiation to people next to that surface, uh, then you can make them feel the temperature that's cooler without having the humidity um, being added to the environment that they're in. And it's sort of a complicated uh, 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 lift or a complicated process uh, to implement, um, but it's, it has a lot of potential and, and we're super interested in investigating it. So I'm glad you're thinking that way. It's already sort of along the same lines that, that we're working. Great. I, I don't see any more questions, but maybe we'll give it a second. Do you have any uh, closing remarks for us? Sure. Well, I'm, ex I'm excited for, for my uh, URP student to, to come to Princeton. I hope we're going to have some fun taking some of these images, um, not just images of my kids. I should have put a thermal image of my kids. Um, but yeah, uh, they're certainly part of the chaos team. Um, but we're, we're excited to sort of go out and investigate this. And 
to lead into maybe uh, Daryl's talk next week, he's one of the people I've been enjoying sort of bringing this, this topic up in terms of what's going on in the urban canyon with, with the sensation of temperature due to radiant emission. So um, when you have more trees and sort of understanding perhaps different trees have uh, different phenotypes, have different amounts of, of leaf temperature reduction. So all trees are doing evapotranspiration out of their leaves and when that water evaporates out of the leaf, it takes some temperature with it. So leaves are also often evaporatively cooled to some extent, depending on how much sun is incident upon them. Um, and so it'd be kind of a fascinating, it's, I'm, I'm excited to sort of exchange areas of expertise and, and, and look at ways in which um, we can more uh, explicitly understand the relationship between the sort of hardscape and built, built infrastructure that I usually investigate in terms of radiant heat exchanges and systems, and then the more um, um, planted and, and green and then also blue in the case of waterfalls and water infrastructure, which also relates to some of the, the other work from other team members in terms of bioswales and, and installing infrastructure in cities that has more um, water and, and plant uh, systems. Because uh, I don't think from an engineering standpoint, a lot of the people in my field looking at, at radiant heat transfer um, have considered scientifically the, the specific role um, that planting and water might play. So super interested uh, to follow up on those topics. Great. That was a wonderful segue for next week. So come on back next week when we talk with Daryl uh, and look at plants a little bit more. Um, we'll also be in touch next week with some information on the annual meeting, which is actually quickly approaching, so stay tuned for that. And I will, as always, distribute the link to the video on our YouTube channel once it is posted. I hope everyone has a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Take some time to be with yes. your friends and family. Don't work too hard, okay, everybody? Thanks, Sarah. You too. Take care. Have a great Thank day, you. everyone.